Folks, you know you're in for a treat when you hear that tune. It's time for another week of the Rec Poker Podcast. I'm your host, Jim Reed, Bluff Serini in the home game and at Rec Poker Jim on Twitter. And I have the best freaking job in the world talking poker with my friends here on the Strategy Forums edition of the podcast every Monday night while we steal each other's chips in the free nightly home game. All right. I have to thank our sponsors, the Running Aces Hotel, Racetrack and Casino. Most of what we do here is free. We're a largely volunteer-based organization, so we depend on support from our sponsors and and also from our premium members who take part in our training material and study opportunities for only $15 a month. And I'll just ask you to ask yourself, do you like talking poker with friends? Because if you do, for less than 50 cents a day, come connect over Zoom with other fun, encouraging poker players like yourself, all studying the same problems, learning the same solutions, and all trying to get better together. And if you want to dip a toe in uh, for free, Um, Just sign up for a free account at rec.poker, where all you need to join is an email address and a smile, although we do insist on both. Um, But remember, you can always get your first month of Rec Poker Premium for only five bucks by using the code Rec Poker at checkout. Now, uh, they let me host the show on Mondays, but I am just one member of the Wrecking Crew, uh, what we like to call our group of wizards that make all the magic happen around here. Um, if you want to find out more about me and the rest of the Wrecking Crew, you can go to rec.poker slash crew. Um, but you can just listen up because you're going to meet one of them tonight, the illustrious John Somsky. John, introduce yourself to Rec Poker Nation, just in case they don't know who you are by now. I'm John Somsky, also known as Poker Geek MN Everywhere. So if you don't know, John Somsky is the man who runs everything to do with the Rec Poker Home Game Club. And regular listeners will know that we are featuring a different mixed game every month here at Rec Poker. You're listening to this episode in February, and that's because we're going to introduce the game of Pot Limit Omaha to you so that you've got some time to practice. This will be the featured mixed game in March. So on the second Wednesday of March, we're going to be playing uh, Pot Limit Omaha in our Player of the Year tournament series. And to give you a chance to practice, um, on the third, fourth, and fifth Wednesdays of the previous month, we're running our practice mixed game series in that same time slot. So if I've done my math right, this episode should come out the day before the very first practiced mixed game in February. So it should be the third Wednesday of the month tomorrow. I hope I got it right. And you can play uh, Pot Limit Omaha for free and practice in our home game club for the next couple of weeks before uh, the March second, second Wednesday of March comes along when we start playing for keeps in the player of the year race. And I'll also uh, just shout out to our listeners. If you think this is fun, Get ready for Marek Madness, which is going to be right around the corner all March long. uh, Taylor Moss will be engineering um, some heads up bracket play. And if you want to find out more about that, just go to rec.poker slash events. And you can see all the great stuff we've got coming up on Twitch for the entire month of Marek. I mean, March, uh, we'll be having these matches and it's going to be a lot of fun. So, John Somsky, you've done such a fantastic job putting the slate of uh, mixed games together all year long. Uh, Pot Limit Omaha is the game that we're playing in March. Why don't you tell our listeners a little bit about sort of the mechanics of the and the rules of the game, and then we'll throw to some segments from our guests in the past with some fantastic tips and advice from the pros on how to play these mixed games to the best of their abilities. That sounds good. So, so far we have played two different draw games this year. And now we're going to be switching it up and switching over to a flop game. So flop meaning it's, Just like No Limit Hold'em, there are three cards on the flop game, three cards on the flop, one card in the turn, one card on the river. So those of you who are familiar with No Limit Hold'em will be understand Pot Limit Omaha fairly easily. The biggest difference are, well, two of them. One is that it's Omaha and second that it's Pot Limit. Um. So the pot limit means that you can bet up to the size of the pot. So, for example, when you have a small blind and a big blind, so you have 1.5 blinds in the thing and you're under the gun, the maximum you could raise to is three and a half blinds. 
the way you calculate that is you first call whatever pending bet is there. So the opening bet is the size of the big blind that you need to match. So now there are two and a half blinds in the pot. Your one from you, one from the big blind, and one from the um, small blind. Small blind, and then so that gives you two and a half. So you can put raise it to another two and a half. So total that is a three and a half big blind bet. Now don't say I'm going to call and then raise because that's a string bet. You don't want to <laughs> do that. It's just going to be you're going to do a pot size bet. So that would be three and a half blinds. And when you have good dealers who are dealing pot limit Omaha, they will have know exactly what the size of the pot is, exactly how many chips it is to put in there. Uh, when you're playing online, the good thing is that there'll be the pot size button and it won't let you do anything more than that. Matter of fact, you can't just say, I'm going to go all in. You can only make the pot size bet limit. Now, let, let me so, stop you right there, because that's something that I find a little intimidating playing live, because I'm mostly an online player. I mostly play No Limit Hold'em. And so if I want to know the size of the pot, I can look at the computer. It'll tell me how much is in the pot. But also, the, the amount of the pot is kind of like less relevant in No Limit games, even though it's also important. Um, to know exactly how much it is isn't that isn't that important. For this game, it's crucially important. Um, how much? How How responsible are we as players when we play live? to actually know how much is in the pot ourselves? And is it quite common instead to sort of rely on the dealer to 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 help you figure out exactly what size you'd have to make your raise? Uh, typically, the dealer will know. Um, people who play a lot of Pot Limit Omaha, which I'll be honest right now, right here, of all of the mixed games, Pot Limit Omaha is probably my weakest mixed game. Mm. Um, so, but there are people who will be there, other players at the table who will know exactly what the bet size is as well. I myself do not have that when I play live. Um, what I often will do, you don't have to make a pat pot limit size mm -hmm. bet. Now, mm -hmm. People make pot limit size bets more often in pot limit Omaha than in no limit hold them because – you don't have the option of overbetting later on in, in the pot. So if you want to size it so you can get stacks in or get your maximum, then you will make more of those pot limit size bets. But you can often look at it and say, well, I can see there's at least $50 in there plus some change. So I'm going to just bet 50 and that might be close enough. Um, the dealer will, of course, let you know. You can also just say, I bet pot, and then the dealer will figure out exactly what that is. If necessary, counting the pot down and then letting you make your bet. And I think just a, a simple example, like you shared earlier, is if there's a hundred bucks in the pot already, um, you would be first kind of matching that with your own hundred, which would mean there was two hundred dollars in the pot. So then you could raise. So your total raise would be to three hundred because Correct. it would be the one hundred that's in the pot originally, the one hundred that you put in to match it. Now the pot's two hundred, and that's how much you can raise. Correct. Okay, I think even I could figure that out eventually. The other aspect that is different than No Limit Hold'em is the fact that this is Omaha. So the difference between Hold'em and Omaha is you are dealt four cards instead of two, and you you think to yourself, well, that's like having if you look at all the combinations, it's almost like having eight different hold them hands. Right. Um, but it, so it's going to be much more powerful, except for there is a little catch. And the catch is you must play exactly two cards from your hand and three cards from the board. So in other words, if you are dealt four aces, mm. that is not a great hand because you will be playing a pair of aces with three cards that are yet to come. So you might get a full house, but you're never going to have the king high full house. And you're never going to make trips with your cards. So, you know, having three of a kind in your hand is also not good because that means one of your cards is going to be dead. You can't get a set with that particular uh, hand there. It, and. And John, uh, one thing that tripped me up when I was first learning this game, if you're used to playing No Limit Hold'em, 
and let's say you've got like the ace of hearts and the jack of spades in your hand when the board comes out with four hearts congratulations you've made the nut flush but if you are playing pot limit omaha you can't just play one card from your hand you need to play two cards from your hand right. so even if there's four hearts on the board and you've got the ace of hearts unless you have another heart in your hand you actually have not made that flush so so learn from my mistake <laughs> i think i lost a big pot uh thinking i had the nut flush in, in a hand when i was playing this or uh, uh, when i was coming up in the game and that one stuck with me i always got to tell people that tip for sure <laughs> and in general for for the hands um so the 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 strength of omaha hands pre, pre-flop the the equities run very close together so that's why you can see a lot of people getting money in pre-flop because the equities are so close together. But it's a good way to also go through a lot of <laughs> a <laughs> lot of money if you're doing that. Um, the thing you want to think of is your four cards are kind of like four legs to a chair. And you want to have all of these kind of working with each other. Mm. So – for example, having an ace, ace, king, queen of two different suits is excellent because you have a pair of aces, which gives you, you know, you can make your set with it. It is the top pair. You, If you have two different suits, that means you're, you have two flush draws you could possibly get. Whereas if you have three suits in the hand, you're only having one flush draw. Um, and obviously, if you have ace, ace, that means they're both nut flush draws as well you're also going for your broadway draw you know you have ace king queen so a jack 10 is going to give you the best possible straight you have a bunch of high cards so all of your cards are kind of working in concert with one another um having cards you know if you're going more towards the middle of the deck having four cards in a row is good particularly if you have a couple of suited pairs in there because now when you there's lots of possibilities where you're going to flop a straight draw in two pair. Um, mm. And then you can either hit your full house if you happen to pair one of the cards you've already paired, or you can get the straight with lots of different possibilities in there. And you can end up having more than just your eight cards on the end, because it could be that you'll have, um, you could have like up to, I think 12 different cards that could finish your straight out in the perfect wrap situations. So you can have lots of outs to give you those straights. And if you can throw in some flushes in there, lots of possibilities uh, to do semi bluffing with. Yeah. And lots of possibilities seems to be the phrase for a game like this, because you can, um, it's very flop dependent because you kind of need to know what's the dressing for the hand that you can make the bigger hands on. But it's also quite common to flop the nuts and be really behind by the time the river comes because it's quite easy to improve the strength of your hand on on a lot of turns and rivers just for the same reason that you say. So uh, one thing that that jumped out to me when I was learning this game is the the relative strength of hands like pair and two pair hands goes down significantly in uh, games like this because people are more likely to be making much stronger hands uh, like sets and straights and flushes. Um, is that is there is there like a line to be drawn between what counts as a really good hand in Omaha versus what counts as a really good hand in Hold'em, or is it really just sort of extremely board dependent and you just kind of have to buckle up and see if you're going to get to the river it is extremely board dependent however um i can't remember the exact odds but years ago someone told me that let's say 70 percent. i don't know if this is the number but 70 percent of the time the nuts changes in omaha <laughs> on the river <laughs> so you know what the theoretical nuts was so it's very difficult it, just because you have the nuts on the flop. You can have a, the nuts on the flop and be in a situation where you should probably fold because 
there are so many other draws. If you're playing against lots of other people with lots of other draws, and if you don't have any room to improve, um, it, it's time you could be a dog with the nuts on the flop, which is something that I don't know ever happens in Hold'em. Right. You know, other than, well, I guess, against a straight flush draw, maybe. But um, there aren't very many cases where you're going to have the nuts on the flop and not be at least have the majority or lion's share of the equity in the pot. So like an example of that would be like having top set on a very wet dynamic board and not having the redraws to the streets uh, or right. flushes or something like that. Um, and of course, I guess you could fill up. Uh, so there is that, that element to it, but yeah, like in, in, in no limit hold we talk about like two pair plus uh, being like that echelon of hands that you can bet confidently bet uh, for value on a lot of boards with. And I think you really have to kind of ratchet that up a couple notches because two pair feels like it's going to be a loser in Omaha as often as it's a winner, if not more so. I, I think that's probably right. Yeah. Interesting. Um, all right. Well, uh, is there anything else that we should share with our audience about this uh, fantastic, wonderful gambly hand where people like to get it in street after street and hope for the best? No, I would just suggest listen to all of the voices that are coming after mine for actual <laughs> uh, strategy here. Because, again, this is my weakest game. Uh, but I do know the rules, so I can help you out with that at least. <laughs> well, thank you so much, uh, John Somsky, for all the work you do for our home game club and our members here at Rec Poker. Um, it, listeners at home, stay tuned. You're about to hear some advice and tips um, from some fantastic mixed game players on how to get the most out of Pot Limit Omaha. Thanks for listening. Okay, Chad McVean, give me a couple tips on how to play Pot Limit Omaha. Well, the great game of PLO, um, you want to have some good starting hands. What I would consider uh, good, you have to have the ace and the king in there, but you don't want to have any low cards. You don't want to have any middle cards. You want to be making a hand that is going to hold up. Um, you will have people drawing. Remember, a set is just a set. It doesn't matter. It's not going to win. Flush, straight, full house. That's what you need. All right, Chris Fox Wallace, give me some advice on how to play Pot Limit Omaha. Yeah, I think when I work with students and I'm, I'm working with people who aren't terribly advanced, uh, the biggest thing in PLO is, is if you focus on not being bet off your equity, you tend to end up in the right decision the vast majority of the time. So the you know the decision that an expert will make, uh, you can usually get that same decision with a, a high frequency, just by making sure that you're not being bet off a bunch of equity. So bluff with your hands that absolutely whiffed, but don't bluff with a hand where you're going to be sad when someone raises you and you have to fold. Uh, like uh, having ten nine on an eight seven uh, an eight six three board, right? You'd be pretty sad to have to fold that if you bet it. So why are you betting it? Um, whereas if you had ace, king, queen, jack on that same eight, seven, three board, you're not, you're not sad to be raised. If they raise you're you need to, you need runner, runner to beat them, you know? So, uh, so bluff with those worst hands and don't bluff with your, your hands that have some equity. And that same is true for some solid made hands. You don't want to, you know, somebody bets, you don't want to raise two pair. And then what now, if they jam, are you folding to a draw? And that's horrible. Or are you calling it off against a set? And that's horrible. So don't raise there because you don't want to be raised off your equity. That, be focused on not not get, having to let go of your equity. And so you know, don't don't generate a pot that's so big that you have to fold away a bunch of equity in a big pot. You know, and and bet hands that you don't mind folding. If somebody raises. All right, Mike Patrick, uh, give me some advice on how to play pot limit Omaha. All right. Uh, more cards, more fun is generally the mantra when it comes to any mixed games. But uh, in Potlum and Omaha, it can get you in trouble just because you have, uh, you know, four cards and you have more possibilities. Eh, don't fall in love with that idea because there are a lot of hands that can get you in trouble They're You know, unless you're really super suited and connected, uh, middle cards are going to get you in some trouble. Um Danglers are the biggest issue that a lot of people have. They will start a hand with three good cards 
and one bat card. So you can have like, you know, King, King, Jack, Deuce. And ultimately, you really only just have a pair of kings there. Um, if you are going to have something that's got a dangler in there, uh, make sure that you're super suited. Um, you can play, you know, high cards with one baby down there, so long as you are suited to the nuts. So if you have like an ace deuce with a pair of queens or something in there, you're going to be okay so long as you are drawing to that. That deuce is, you know, going to be part of your flush draw if you're going to go for that. So um definitely don't open up your range too wide just because you have too many cards just because you have more cards and uh be careful with the danglers but uh they can kind of be okay if you are suited so i've played a couple of hands of plo where having that dangler has kind of come in handy and it's been super disguised so that can kind of come in handy there so nice all right norman chad give us some tips on how to play pot limit omaha Pot in Omaha is actually pretty simple, but simple as can be difficult. It's hand selection like it is in most games. And then when the flop comes out, because you usually get it all in on the flop, you've got to be in a good position. You do not want to be trailing. So in, in Pot Limit Omaha, you want to start with hands that work together. So those are cards that could make straights, three cards to a straight with a pair, like king, queen, queen, jack. If that's double suited, whoop! You're going to Sizzler. So you want you, you want double suited hands. You want to be drawing to the nuts. You always want to be drawing to the nuts. In pot limit, as as pot limit players would tell you, it's it, unlike no limit, you can draw, you can, you can flop a set in pot limit and be statistically behind against a combination draw of flushes and straights. So you just got to make sure you're playing hands that work together and are drawing to the nuts. All right, Rob Washam, give me a tip on how to play Pot Limit Omaha. All right, the biggest mistakes I see PLL players make is playing too many hands pre-flop. It looks like you have all these opportunities to make hands because you have four cards. And now, obviously, you have to use two of the cards in your hand when you're playing PLL. Uh, But it seems like you have all of these opportunities to make hands. but um to quote our our boy Tommy Angelo don't play hands with danglers you know you want everything to be connected in some way you don't want that you know you you got 9 10 jack it looks really great but then you have a 4 with it well it's not that 4 doesn't come into play at all so now you're only playing 3 cards against everybody else's 4 cards so you got to keep in mind that um you don't want to play hands with danglers. You obviously want to play two suited hands if you can. If you get a two suited hand, that's great, especially with the aces. Suited aces are great. Keep in mind, even a suited ace with a dangler is not that great of a hand because the dangler is not going to come into play. The other thing keep in mind is once you get your pre flop ranges in order, and you're playing cards that are connected without danglers, a lot of suited things. Keep in mind that when you're drawing after the flop, never draw to less than the nuts. If you're not drawing to the nuts, you're drawing to lose. So keep that in mind. Don't draw to the bottom end of a straight. That'll never play in a PLO game. You need to be drawing to the top end of the straight. Same with the flushes. Don't draw to a 10 high flush uh, because somebody else is going to have a jack queen king or ace high flush because there's just so many cards out there that can make hands so keep that in mind preflop i think is the key don't play too many cards even though they look they look so nice they look so friendly let's play this hand um it's just going to lead you to doom and that's all i got for plo Robbie Straczynski, give me some advice on how to play Pot Limit Omaha. Okay, this is not necessarily game-specific, but I would say brush up on your math because Mm. one of the more intimidating things at a Pot Limit Omaha table is when someone just says pot, 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 and they instantly know exactly how much that is. So you should be that guy. You should be that girl. Try to pay attention to the math 
and get used to adding the value of chips or knowing based on how many players are in the hand what the pot's going to be. Brush up on that. All right. Well, that was another fun conversation about mixed games. Uh, my thanks to, of course, the Running Aces Hotel Racetrack and Casino for their support over the years. Um, to John Somsky and the other members of our Wrecking Crew panel here talking about their love of mixed games. And all our fantastic guests who contributed their uh, segments, their thoughts and tips and advice on how to get the most out of uh, some different mixed games that we're going to be playing. So I'd encourage you, head on over to Rec.Poker, sign up for a free account there. Uh, you can go to rec.poker slash home game and find out all about the different mixed games that are being played throughout the year, a different one every month. And I would encourage our listeners, if you're a No Limit Hold'em player, dip a toe into some of the mixed games. You'll be surprised how much fun you can have. So uh, without further ado, I'll just say thanks for joining us for another week of the Rec Poker Podcast. And I hope I get to see you all again next week or sometime real soon. Uh, good luck on the felt, folks. Thanks again. Bye for now.